um, my life is a mess right now. So I, last night, wrote, no, two nights ago, read the paper. I'm just going to clarify what that means. It means he's moving and he's busy. It doesn't mean that he's like hit rock bottom and does heroin. Just to clarify. Okay, thanks. Translation <laughs> services. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Full-time job, moving twice in three weeks. Uh, two small children under the age of two. And two my master's degree all at once. So no free time. So this is all like what I wrote in notes as I was falling asleep on the floor of my mostly barren house at the moment. So I'm Mac called Babby. I founded Skull Space, uh, founded Papers We Love, uh, founded with other people, of course, uh, B-Sides, and occasionally run various stuff. Um, I talk a lot, given the slightest, slightest opening, and never shut up until somebody makes me. Uh, yeah, that's about it. So, this talk is about Lisp, the first paper ever published on Lisp, which is by John McCarthy in 1960. Uh, it has a really daunting name. So its name is, oh god, this is terrible to write with. Alex, you failed me. That's the best one. There we go. Recursive functions. Uh, symbolic expressions. This is the name of the paper? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, computation by machine. So, a lot of times I find that academic papers have just terrible titles. This is not an exception particularly, but one of the nice things about this title in my opinion, is that it actually tells you what the paper's about. So recursive, OK, let's tighten this up a bit. Does anybody here not know how to program? Awesome. Does anybody here not know what recursive functions are? I know what functions are. Is that where you just curse over and over again? <laughs> huh? Are you serious? <laughs> I'm never sure with you. <laughs> OK. So just to be safe, <laughs> uh, recursive functions are functions that are defined in terms of themselves. So the classic examples of this are the Fibonacci function, where whenever you calculate a number uh, down to base cases, it's always you take this number and you take the two previous numbers in the Fibonacci series and add them together and that's your new number. And you just keep going, taking the last two, adding them to make a new one. Uh, the other classic example is factorial, where if you give an, take a number like 100, uh, you, to, make, to calculate the factorial, you take one less than it and you multiply that by the number you already have. So it's always in terms of itself until you get down to a base case, which is just like start at zero or start at one, that sort of thing. Uh, symbolic expressions, which is sexpers, uh, is pretty much the entirety of Lisp. Everything is represented in this way. Data is represented in this way. Code is represented in this way. Uh, the abstract syntax tree that's created after parsing Lisp itself that you can then run macros on and do all sorts of wacky things on is itself a uh, symbolic expression. So that's pretty key. And computation by machine. This is my favorite one. About, it, it's a 34 page paper and about 20 pages in, they're like, okay, we've set stuff up, here's the interpreter. And it's just one page. There's the interpreter. And then mm -hmm. like a little bit on the second page. What's it written in? Itself. What? Mind blown, right? Okay. It's recursive. <laughs> It's like they were setting you up for it this whole time. So why did they actually bother making this? Because you know everybody has a reason to make a programming language, uh, except for certain exceptions. <laughs> uh, so it was 1958, and McCarthy got on a project to create something called Advice Taker. Uh, he explains it in all this detail and sort of goes through what it is. Short version is, it's an expert system. 
you give it information, you fill it with things like uh, just facts you know about things like, for example, uh, if your eyes are bleeding, you're probably going to die. If people who die should have wills, and your eyes are currently bleeding, therefore you might want to see a lawyer about making a will. It sort of puts those bits together without you having to connect them yourself with if statements and stuff like that. So that's a pain in the ass. So that sort of style of programming, where you just fill it full of facts and then it can connect it for you when you ask questions, is known as declarative programming. Uh, good examples of that, like the examples of that nowadays, are uh, SMT, when you do uh, satisfiable modulus theorem or something, this, this uh, SAT3 stuff, or if you use prolog, things like that. Uh, so, yeah, so they're building this advice taker, Bye. and they needed a way to actually represent all this data they were going to plug it in, and once they created this representation for the data, they also started messing around with other things, and like, well, not only could we represent the data, the actual questions, the declarative logic on this, we could also use that same representation as a programming language. And so Lisp was born. Uh, so how they started by designing this is they created, there it is. They created a, uh, it's based on a way of representing partial functions. Does anybody here not know what partial functions are? Okay, cool. Uh, partial functions are functions uh, where not every uh, data, every piece of data, every question you can ask it actually has an answer in the system. So for instance, if you had a partial function that uh, determines, is Mac friends with this person? And you put in the name Justin, it would say no. If you put in the name Alex, it would say yes. If you put in the name of the guy who just walked in who I've never seen before, it would say, I have no idea, that's undefined. So that's what a partial function means. You can stick some things in and it won't give you yes or no. It'll just say, I can't answer that. Um, so the other thing about this is it was made on the IBM 704. That was the original target of Lisp. And IBM sold about 140 of those, like ever. Maybe <laughs> slightly more, you know, numbers are always sketchy that old. Uh, so there aren't very many of those around anymore. Uh, so one of the nice things they mentioned in the opening introduction of the paper is this whole scheme for Lisp is not platform dependent. In no way is the design tied to that actual IBM 704. A couple of the uh, mnemonics and the nomenclature of certain operators are tied to the 704, and that's caused people to be annoyed for the past 55 years on it. But that's okay. Uh, so this is my absolute favorite part of the entire paper, uh, which happens on page three. He introduces conditional expressions. So he explains that he invented out of nowhere this notation, uh, where if you take a proposition, there's an expression, and you can have a bunch of them, as many as you want. So this representation is his conditional expressions. Uh, you always have a proposition and an expression, and it evaluates from left to right. It starts by evaluating the proposition, determines whether uh, propositions are statements that are either true or false, or in this case, because everything's partial functions, it could be undefined. So if you ever hit an undefined in the evaluation of anything, uh, the whole thing becomes undefined and just craps out. But if it's false, it goes on to the next one. And if it's true, it short circuits, which is a behavior that I'm sure we're all you know, familiar with nowadays. It short circuits and it evaluates that E. Uh, if it doesn't, if any of these prove false, any of the propositions, it doesn't bother evaluating the E, which is very, very useful. And it only evaluates 
like the bare minimum of what it needs to, which is slightly more efficient. So there's a footnote, which may be the best footnote I've ever seen on the bottom of page three that describes this. And it says, oh, by the way, I submitted this to the uh, committee that was designing Algol 60, because turns out before this point, conditional notation wasn't a thing. They didn't have real if statements anywhere. But they rejected it because it was too mathy, and the committee had previously decided that no new notations were going to be implemented. From this point forth, in the Algol 60 standard, you were only going to have English words added anywhere. So as a result, the guy who was in charge of it, Bacchus Noir, sorry, no, John Bacchus of the Bacchus Noir form of uh, grammar uh, layout, he instead himself implemented after seeing this, I believe, uh, if then else. So mm -hmm. just to sort of cement in your mind how long ago this was, this was before if statements were a thing. Mm -hmm. And this guy made his own, which if you've ever programmed with lists very much, this is way better than an if statement. It's like an if statement and a switch statement all in one. It's very, very nice to program with. Mm -hmm. uh, so just to give an example of this. Can this I use the red ink? It's a little easier to read. The, the pink? I, mean, um, I guess it's kind of red. <laughs> sure. Okay, so there's a function known as absolute value. For those not familiar with it, uh, if you put a number into the absolute value function, it'll positiveify it. So if you put in minus 10, it'll give you 10. If you put in 0, it'll give you 0. If you put in 10, it'll just give you back 10. Uh, now, up until, actually, throughout this entire paper, the notation is super sketchy. He <laughs> sort of goes back and forth a bit, and it kind of looks like there's a couple errors. Uh, so at, if things seem a little odd, what I'm writing on the board, it's not necessarily that I'm crazy. It might be. But it might be just that the paper sort of switches back and forth and plays it sort of loosey-goosey with notation. So. Conditional notation here. Uh, we're just going to assume that all numbers and all uh, predicates, meaning uh, connective operators like uh, not it not or and or greater than less than equals all that jazz just makes sense, and we're not going to deal with it because we don't have the time to deal with it. So he notes in the paper that normally when you bother defining uh, absolute value in math, you just define it in words. You don't actually define it in notation. You just have a little sentence beside it saying, oh, this is kind of how it is. And I was actually looking at piecewise functions, because we all know piecewise functions are a thing. And What's yeah. piecewise function? <laughs> Sorry, OK. Quick diversion. Uh, piecewise function, as I failed to a piecewise function is the thing that we all kind of know, uh, uh, learn in university usually, which is the other way to define this. Now, on Wikipedia and stuff, it wouldn't tell me when that was invented. So since uh, McCarthy says that normally you define it in words, I'm guessing that piecewise came to be used uh, after the paper, because I prefer to give McCarthy the benefit of the doubt, because the dude's badass. So this notation introduces one of the interesting things, is that sometimes, very often, uh, you have a preposition, proposition that is just true. So this effectively, as I failed to draw, is your else. So to talk this through, if you have a negative number, return the result of negativing the negative number, which turns a positive. For anything else, meaning the only way to get here is if it wasn't a negative number because of the evaluation order. Anything else, well, it's already positive, so just add it back. This is the first time in the paper he 
explains his conditional notation, and it's used everywhere. Everything else, uh, especially the eventual interpreter that he gives you, is defined as nested conditional notation, conditional notation, conditional notation for like a page or two. And it makes things terse, which is kind of nice because you can fit a lot in. It's like, it's like if ternary operators weren't scary as hell. That's how I think of it. Uh, so the other nice thing about conditional notation is that it lets us do away with and or not, which may not be obvious on the surface, but if you have, got it. If you have P and Q, you can do which you have to stare at for a minute to actually convince yourself that it's true. But to talk that one through, uh, with an and, just to explain it in more detail than I need. Uh, if the first one's true, then we need to look at the second one, because they both need to be true. So if the first one's true, we need to look at the value of the second one, and the value of the second one is what determines whether the whole thing is true or false. If the first one isn't true, meaning you fall through here to here, then you just return false, because it's false. Uh, the other ones, just to do them quick, is P or Q, which is if P is true, or yeah, or true, then you evaluate Q. Uh, there's also not P, which is it's P, it's false, and otherwise it's true. So looking at true to false and true to true sort of messes up your head for a bit. And that's often why we don't really use that notation anymore. We use a slightly tweaked one. Uh, throughout the rest of this, there will be commas, and there are no commas in this, really. Uh, there's also these arrows. We generally don't use arrows in modern this. So a lot of minor tweaks have been done over the years, but the core is still in use and pretty much like this. So. And once again, feel free to interrupt me. Digressions are good, especially with the amount of material I have prepared. So, <laughs> I, in, in the list I've seen, has never been. Um, I've never seen like the proposition and then the right hand side of the arrow. What is that like now? Awesome. Good question. I was actually going to show that later, I'm but it nowadays it looks. Curious. Actually, so deeper in the paper, it looks very similar to this. They actually introduced the column later. Uh, so what it looks like is you have your proposition in here, and then you have your expression in here. And you do that a bunch of times, and then eventually you just true it out. So it's similar, except in modern Lisp, they don't allow commas. And the reason is, uh, in this Lisp, their symbols, which are kind of their names, their identifiers, their whatever, uh, allow single uh, inline spaces, which is crazy talk to anybody who's programmed you know, in the last 30 years. Uh, but back then, they're like, this seems like a good idea. Let's just use commas. So if you get rid of the spaces, you can get rid of the commas, and suddenly everything shrinks down, and you have to hit those keys a lot less. Uh, the other thing is this, putting them in these brackets, which are very, or sorry, parentheses, which are very, very important for all of Lisp, as we'll see as we get later, uh, lets you avoid all kinds of things. You can just have everything be ordered and various things implied by that order. So that gets rid of the arrows. Thank you for distracting. That is wonderful. Especially with legitimate questions. I made it seem natural. <laughs> OK, so um, so far we've had sort of a sketchy way of defining 
our functions. Like we showed you uh, absolute value, and we kind of cheated it out and made the little x like you'd see in math and just an equal sign. That's not really legit. That's just we didn't want to have to explain stuff yet. So uh, who here hasn't heard of Alonzo Church? OK, cool. Uh, Alonzo Church was the guy who came around, I believe, slightly before Turing and uh, had very similar results in certain ways. Uh, his results were a lot more mathy. Uh, he created what's known as lambda calculus, which is believed to be equivalent to uh, Turing machines in power, but I think there's an issue where that hasn't been entirely proved yet, so there's some people still thinking about it. Um, but he designed a notation which heavily influenced uh, Lisp, which was known as lambda notation. And if we want to make a function, so up to this point we've had, like we can say something like that. And that's what Church calls a form. Uh, modern Lisp has different names for forms, or different, they use the word form differently. But back in this paper, that was called a form, just sort of a freestanding expression that didn't have much in the way of structure or syntax, just sort of, here's math, that is a form. But that's not particularly useful if we want to actually apply or stick in things to those variables. We need a way of putting those in. So naturally, you know, we want to be able to do something like that because that is more or less what we're used to with math, right? Can you write that a little bit bigger, please? Sorry. Size is really bad. You knew this was going to happen. <laughs> but now it's very light pink. Very slightly pink. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what you get for asking questions, despite me asking you to ask questions. Uh, so <laughs> the issue is this isn't, like, this works. But it's not particularly well defined, the way the mappings work and all that sort of stuff. So, oh, there we go. It's getting more and more pink as time goes on. Try switching colors. <laughs> you sure you aren't going to yell at me if I switch colors? You got a whiteboard pen. I, I do. I should probably use that one. But I'm not giving up on this one yet because okay. it's slightly better lit, I figure. Just spit on it. You're, you're welcome to do that as I use this. <laughs> Uh, so, they created the lambda notation, which is is that a semicolon? No, that's a comma. Sometimes they have semicolons, sometimes they have commas, and it's just maddening for what they choose when. So this is lambda notation. I'm sure everybody's here has encountered a lambda at some point in their life in programming languages. And if you haven't, you should get better programming languages that you use. So, lambda notation is a way of defining a nameless, anonymous function, uh, kind of on the fly. And it's really the basis of this version of Lisp. Any function that you want to make, you need to declare with lambda. So, if we wanted to take that function from before and make it into a lambda, we would do that. Yeah, that's how you do it. So there's a lot of notation, and keeping it in my head is not something that's going to happen. Uh, and then, yeah, plug in the arguments. So that's their way of making functions. You throw up a lambda, then you've got your first thing is your arguments. It's a list of arguments. Then the next thing. Uh, in later versions, the next any number of things are your symbolic expressions, which are evaluated in order using the rules in the interpreter. And then that whole expression gets evaluated and applied, which we'll see a bit later. And it itself has a value. So the thing that this introduces, which was kind of revolutionary, is that you don't have functions and procedures with procedures not returning anything, and functions returning a value. Everything is evaluated and then becomes a value, which is very similar to what you might see in Ruby, 
or what you might see in some of the functional languages nowadays. Uh, but the fact that this was in 1960 is, once again, I will say, badass. So the issue with, or the nice thing about this is, uh, does everybody here know about closures? Does anybody not know about closures? I don't know about closures. OK. I know about closures. Yeah, I don't trust it. OK. <laughs> then I'm going to talk about closures. <laughs> Everybody can blame Edwin. Uh, so the nice thing about this is with Lisp especially, you end up throwing functions around a lot because the notation to create a function has no name attached to it. It's easy to just toss a function out. You can just nest them and go crazy, which some people do, and you shouldn't quite go crazy. Um, so what we can do is we can make, you can make uh, expressions, or sorry, you can make functions which have some bound variables and some free variables. Bound variables are what they sound like. They're bound to a value. Uh, whereas free variables are just waiting to have something slotted into them. So, talking like static and variables? What? Static variables versus natural variables? No, not quite. Um, it's a bit, if you think of it like a, like instances of a class, like objects, each of those has its own like environment. That's kind of the same thing. Yeah, it's sort of like as the outer function is a class, which can be instantiated into versions of the inner functions, which have their own private variables that may differ from other instances' private variables. To go all object or something like classes and objects. Yeah, yeah, just making stuff up as I go. So, <laughs> let's give the example which might hopefully clear it up. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Okay. I don't know. A standard rule in Lisp is that you just add right parentheses until it compiles. All right. So, this is a function which produces another function. Now, this at this point, both of these variables are free. Not, there's no x in existence. There's no m in existence. We've never set them or defined them or given them value. But what we can do is we can create something, add 1, and we can, yeah, we'll call it like this. So we actually evaluate add one, and the evaluation of it produces another function which has the m variable defined as it's bound to the number one, but the x variable continues to be undefined. So in the future, you can do something like add, I don't know, nine, and it'll spit up 10 for you. So this gets bound to x, and everything proceeds. Yes. Is it add, add or add, add one? one. Right. Okay. That's a good point. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> so yes, add one. So this is super, super useful, because when you start having lambdas, you can actually start building things like your own classes, because you can have information hiding. You can have instantiation of similar versions of the same thing. Lambdas buy you lots if they're powerful enough. Python lambdas are not powerful enough to buy you this much. <laughs> I like Python, but you know. Do you hear all the Python programmers in the room wince? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Even Java has lambdas, man. Like, come on. So uh, you can also do recursion. So we mentioned factorial before. Uh, just as a refresher for uh, things. So if it's zero, you get one because somebody said so. Uh, and otherwise, you get n times n minus one factor. Now, this notation is crazy talk, uh, but we're still going to use it because we've never introduced the dot, we've never introduced how the hell you can have an exclamation mark, just code. Uh, so 
what we can do with this is we can translate it into our kind of not quite yet Lisp notation. And what we can do is we can make it, how exactly does this happen? Let's just draw it out. So we can call it fact because n pound is not, or I'm sorry, n bang is not the same. Uh, and we make it like this using the notation we just introduced. One otherwise T gives us okay. dot fact and minus one. Okay, so this is pretty cool. It almost looks like it should work. There's just one minor problem, and that is because of various things about evaluation and stuff. We've used the name, the identifier, the symbol fact inside of the definition of an anonymous function, and it isn't defined yet. It's not actually assigned. The lambda is evaluated, and then afterwards, the fact uh, symbol is assigned a value in the attribute list that constitutes the environment. So to get around this, it introduces a new notation called label, which is easy because we evaluate that first. We sort of create an entry for that in our global attribute list, the environment that lets us then reference it later. And the fact that it may not actually have anything assigned to it doesn't matter because suddenly we've introduced the concept of symbols. So symbols. Uh, which hopefully are on the next page. They are awesome. It's almost like there was a plan. Um, yeah. So symbols, uh, I talked about briefly earlier, but at this point in Lisp, symbols are all uppercase. They can have single spaces in them, any number of single spaces, so long as, you know, each one of those is one. This is totally happy with this. That's crazy talk. We would never, ever, ever want to use anything like that. Uh, but the benefit is it lets you use spaces and then you have to use common. Okay, I'm kidding, there's no benefit. So we have identifiers. Now, internally, each of the identifiers in this program are just assigned uh, like an incremental number. The first identifier you create is assigned one, and then slotted into the global attribute list, which looks something like, uh, I don't know. Kind of something like that, with just a bunch of entries, with the number increasing. Slightly more complicated than that in modern times, but the point is, each of them maps to a unique number don't worry about it, it works somehow. Uh, so once you have symbolic, once you have symbolic expressions, meaning expressions of these symbols, like we're slowly working towards here from our sort of origins with math, you can start assigning things to those symbols, you can start making functions, making variables, building things up a little more because you have names. Uh, and just to preview where this eventually all goes, Wow, I've been talking for a long time. <laughs> I'll speed it up slightly. To preview where this all goes, um, eventually they give you a mapping between sort of the crazy syntax that we've been using right now, which is ugly as heck, and the all parentheses, all the time, more or less modern syntax that gets used nowadays, which is way easier to write macros for and other such things. So uh, symbolic notation, or symbolic expression of which Lisp is almost entirely written, are of the form, uh, so, where's the first one? There's the first one. So they treat symbolic expressions, like that, as a pair, uh, 
the way it actually gets represented deep down in the IBM 704 and then put into sort of a linked list structure is like that. Now the IBM 704 had like 32 registers and they each had two different pieces. Uh, this is the address piece and this is the decrement piece. And this is super, super important because all you need as, we, as, as computer scientists using binary with binary trees and binary and all the things, once you have two, it's good enough to do most things. So with just these two, you can make a pair. You can, okay, I guess I need commas because of the thing. You can make a list of symbols. This is nil, in case you wonder. So what you can do is you can chain together these cons cells, as they're called. And you can either have a pair in which, uh, normally when you make linked lists, uh, if you've never done it before, uh, you have two different pointers in a struct. One points to your data, one points to the next one in the list. The problem is uh, you can't get pairs in that sort of structure because the next item in the list, usually it's typed and your data has to be one type and the next thing in the list has to be another. But when you just play it all loosey-goosey, you can do whatever the hell you want. You can do these pairs, which are kind of nice because if you don't do a pair, and a lot of times you need pairs in computer programming, uh, the entire attribute list, which is your global environment for all of your symbols, is a series of pairs like that. So it's slightly more efficient because you'll only need one for a pair instead of two if you don't allow this sort of system. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, you can have arbitrary nesting, which is very important when you're writing programs in this format. You can have So the way we build that is we start at the front. So we have an M, and that points to another list. Uh, another list. And there's nothing after that. This is your other list here. So this is the sublist. That list starts with an A. And then the second element is actually a new list. <laughs> and that new list is actually a pair. So you can go to town making all kinds of trees with this. This effectively allows you to make arbitrary trees. It's the short version. And as we all know, trees are useful. File systems, various kinds of networking, uh, binary trees, so all kinds of things are trees. Cleaning the so, atmosphere. What? Cleaning the atmosphere. Uh -huh. Yes. Yeah. Boom. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Very, very useful. This is deep down how everything got represented. And almost any time you deal with lists, sorry, lists, uh, <laughs> that was going to happen once. <laughs> Uh, you're going to need to be able to access the first cell and the second cell. Uh, the second cell, if it's a pair, actually has something in it. But if you have a nested list or just a list with a bunch of things chained together, sometimes your second cell is everything else. It's the head of the remainder of the list. So the way to access these is the contents of the address register and the contents of the decrement register. To this day, those two mnemonics are used, and they're generally the first thing people complain about uh, with Lisp. Usually the second thing is the goddamn parentheses. Uh, but you can just add more on the right, like we've seen. It will all work out. So, functions. 
speed it up. Uh, so there are five core functions in Lisp, uh, which is crazy that there are only five. Those five are Atom, which we haven't really seen, um, Equal, which is easy, Car and Cutter, which we just went over, and Cons. So what each one does is easy to describe. Uh, equals, uh, if you put in, so if we use our terrible notation, if your two arguments are the same symbol, and it only works on symbols, then it returns true, otherwise it returns false. It just tells you if two symbols are the same. It can't handle anything but symbols, which in this version of Lisp are the only atoms that exist. Now, an atom is not a list. Pretty much anything that isn't a list is an atom. Not exactly correct, but this is 1960. We can say whatever we want. Uh, they're making, they don't have F statements. He gets to make the rules. So, uh, nowadays atoms also include arguably things like the empty list, because technically it has no subcomponents, therefore it's atomic. Uh, also includes things like numbers, uh, symbols, which is what it includes here, um, and a few other things that I can't think of. Uh, other lists have a lot of core data types. Uh, car and cutter, we can just ignore. Cons is important because uh, when you con something, what gets spit out is this, which is effectively this. So if you want to make new symbolic expressions, cons is the only way to do it. And it only glues two things together. So a lot of time when you deal with list, you've got to deal with unraveling everything recursively, which is why it's so important in the title, and go, getting to the back and then building it back up the call stack. So the other thing that you can do with cons, because cons isn't just limited to atoms, you can also do things like, oh, I want B and C comma D. And it will glue those together for you. It can literally glue anything you want to anything you want. It's just you just plug things in and it sticks them together like super glue. So these five core um, Symbols, no, they're not really symbols at this point. Uh, core functions, that's the word I'm looking for, are what you get in 1960 Lisp. And they're important because each one has to get implemented by the interpreter. And to get, uh, and to get implemented by the interpreter, it needs to be a symbol. And we haven't dealt with quoting yet. And all this other fun stuff. So, that's a boring one. So this stuff, uh, th these expressions I've been dealing with, with the square brackets, that kind of look ugly and not what you'd expect of Lisp if you've ever seen it before, these are called M expressions or meta expressions. They got thrown out like not quite day one, but pretty soon, uh, even in the paper itself, he gives an explanation of how to convert to S expressions from M expressions so we don't have to pretend that they exist anymore. So there is a function which I have to show you. Uh, it's called find first. We're just going to call it FF. Uh, it finds the first atom in anything you give it. So you give it a giant list, list with sub lists, and it will find the first atom in the list. So it's short definition, but we're going to translate it in a minute. So I have to actually write it out. Because uh, I didn't have time to make slides. But my slides are never any good, anyways. Uh, is it semicolon there? No, apparently it's a comma. Uh, otherwise, 
you you failed me out. Uh, <laughs> Car X, and then just whatever. So it takes X. If it's already an atom, it just hands it back to you. If not, it takes the first thing in the list and runs through the check again. So it just keeps like breaking open lists until something isn't a list, and then it tosses it back to you. So there is a conversion that they give on how to change these terrible expressions into also terrible, way too verbose expressions that are at least S expressions. Um, in this paper, they wanted to sort of make it pure, and they explained that there's better ways to represent S expressions that aren't as verbose as this, but he didn't want to go and, the paper's already 34 pages, so he didn't want to take the extra time. So the short and quick way of doing it that is kind of verbose. Okay, it's not short, it's quick and inelegant. So he gives you a list of about five or seven rules on how to convert between M expressions and S expressions, and I'm just gonna do it here quick. I've already screwed it up. Oh well. This is like more or less right, not actually right, <laughs> because I've apparently forgot one or two letters here already. slides. I regret everything. Uh, oh, geez. Oh, so many quotes. Almost done, I promise. There we go. Good enough. So this is the conversion of the M expression to the S expression. It uses, so one of the, uh, there's two rules, <coughs> or three rules that really are important here. Uh, the first is label. Uh, any of these, uh, I mentioned earlier that symbols had to all be uppercase, and functions, I didn't mention, uh, are all lowercase. But when you convert an M expression to an S expression, all function names need to be symbols to be able to look it up in the global attributes. So as a result, first version, or first rule, uppercase all the things. Second rule, if you have a conditional statement, the conditional statement uh, from that previous notation at the beginning, start it with the word cond and replace all the uh, arrows with commas and put them in little lists. Other rule, anytime, a, uh, anytime you're not using label, you're actually calling a function, you need to put the word quote before it. So if you're actually using a function in a way that itself, the definition of the function needs to be evaluated, you need quote. So that's why FF is quoted, car is quoted, Adam should be quoted, but I had already written it down and didn't want to go back. So this is more or less modern Lisp. Uh, it's more verbose than we'd like. Nowadays, a quote is literally a quote. Nowadays, uh, label, you just replace with a shorter word. Um, you don't need to quote necessarily every use of a function depending on how you're using it. Uh, you usually only need to quote it in the opposite scenario that they've decided here. So, the modern version of this is not that far off. Okay. What is C? 
This is what happens when you fall asleep while writing your notes. X, and then otherwise, uh, you do F, F of, nope, F, F of car of X. So that's the more modern version. No quoting necessary. You only need quoting on things when you need to briefly delay the evaluation because you're about to pass it to something you want that thing to evaluate. Uh, con sticks around. Uh, modern lists tend to actually replace con with an if statement. Not always, but usually you have both at your disposal. And if you have an if statement, you can just remove that true. Uh, because often you want one thing or the other. You don't want a list of possibilities. Uh, behind the scenes, the if is actually a macro, which we might discuss at the end when we are already out of time, uh, that lets you just juggle things and make the if turn into a con with a little bit extra. So, wow, I have a lot more here. Okay, I'm three minutes from the end, and I didn't realize I had stuff. Okay, can you guys handle another five, ten minutes? I have to run in five, but yeah. Okay, well, you're dead to me. But other than that, <laughs> I'll see you online. It's fine. It's fine. I still love you. <laughs> a heart in the air. Um, so the, the final thing I want to talk about, which I like wrote 10 minutes before the presentation started, is the interpreter. The interpreter is awesome because it's written, as we discussed at the start, in Lisp itself. One of the first things you tend to do uh, when you actually learn Lisp is what's called the Metacircular Evaluator Project, where you build your own Lisp in Lisp that evaluates Lisp manually, and it's just, it's just magic, and I don't know. It's messed up and probably violates something that uh, Grinnell would tell you, but it's awesome. So, I'm going to need lots of room for this. Apparently Kilroy was here. OK, so um, the core of the interpreter is eval and apply. And usually they draw it like, I'm going to screw this up, but like yin and yang style. It's on the cover of a couple awesome books, like the wizard book. Uh, the idea is apply is what happens when you take a function and you take some variables and you smash them together, you apply the function to the variables. The val is what happens beforehand when you take each variable and the function itself and you evaluate it. So the function itself is the definition of the function. You evaluate that, you get the actual function out of it. Each argument you evaluate and they can be functions themselves or they might be literals or they might be any sort of crazy thing. But that whole system of evaluating, evaluating and applying circularly and uh, going down and nested uh, is the core of the interpreter, which is, as I mentioned, one page, which is awesome. Uh, unfortunately, it's written in this terrible, terrible, terrible uh, M expression format, but at least it's shorter than S expressions. So the core of this whole thing is apply. Uh, it takes a function, and it takes arguments. And what it does is it evals and smashes together the result of that and app Q. There's actually a bunch of uh, helper functions that we're not going to cover because, oh my god, they could take up more pages. But this is. Yeah, that's, and that matches to that, okay, and no. So what happens is you actually, uh, app queue takes every argument and it puts a quote in front of it because they like quotes. Uh, the It gets smashed together. Uh, the function gets smashed together in a list. List. Wow, I can't say that. With the quoted arguments, and then that whole thing 
which is effectively the function and the arguments together in a list, gets evaluated. And then, as part of that, the apply somehow magically, which I didn't write down because it takes up more room, takes the evaluated function and applies it, which is something we're not going to discuss so much, uh, to the arguments. Okay. So eval is the interesting part of this whole deal. Uh, eval takes an expression and an attribute list. And this is one of my favorite things, is that in other languages, you, if you were dealing with something like eval, I'd expect them not to include the attribute list. I'd expect them to just sort of say, oh, we're evaluating an expression. But the fact that there's this attribute list that gets passed in is important because it's what gives you lambdas, it's what gives you data hiding, it's what gives you all this sort of crazy stuff that you can do. Uh, because you can swap out your environment, you can swap out the mappings of the symbols to the values to give you different results. So, this is the interpreter, basically. Uh, and the interpreter starts off uh, by, is this right? Yes, this is right. Okay. So, it starts off by saying, okay, the expression that we got passed in, is it an atom? And if it's an atom, look up with the association list, which I just erased. Uh, look up the expression in the association list, and that becomes the value of the valid set. Otherwise, if it's not an atom, take, yeah, that's right. Got it right over here because this gets big. Uh, otherwise, take the first piece of the expression, and we know that this is going to work because it's not an atom, therefore it has to have substructure. Uh, it has to be divisible. And then run a conditional expression on the first element of the sub-expression. And it then goes through each of the five of these, which we won't go through because that's just a pain. So it takes that and it compares it against quote. And this is Uh, and we get to introduce this notation, uh, which exists also in modern lists. So because you're dealing with nested symbolic expressions, which are effectively linked lists, you need a quick way of sort of tearing them open. And they've extended car and cutter to create sort of any variation of using one after the other. So this is... Uh, a cutter and then a car. Specifically, this is car, cutter, E. All the A's happen on the outside, all the D's happen on the other side. Uh, I think you can go up to 10 in a lot of lists. So you can have like 10 crazy operations, but if you're doing that many operations, you should probably split it down into smaller pieces. So that's written as like C A A R or C A B R or something. C A D R, C triple A, double D R, stuff like that. You can. It gets pretty crazy, but you know, it's it's like uh, having three stars in front of a pointer in C. You just sort of glaze over and like it works. I'm not going to question it. It seems awesome. You just play with the A's and the D's until you get the right value out, basically. Um, so, did I do that right? Yeah, so if you find the quote, so if you find that the first element of your sub-expression is a quote, you can be guaranteed, unless you're crazy and you've done something wrong, that the second element will actually be your atomic symbol that could be referenced or extracted by the first thing. And since it's all sort of a circle, that will happen in the next step. So this lets you pull out from quotes uh, your symbol, and it delays the evaluation one turn, basically. Uh, the next one that you get to do is atom, and we're only going to do two of these, or three. 
just because cons is whatever. It should be up case. And Adam is uh, this goes a little deeper. And oh, that goes deeper than I thought. Whatever. There's there's more brackets there. I'm tired of writing brackets. Uh, especially since they do too many. So with this one, uh, just like quote, any time that you have Adam as your first element, you can expect that your second element is going to be something uh, you can mess with. So you take your second element with the catter and, uh, of the sub-expression, then you evaluate it in the context of your attribute list, then you ask if it's an Adam. So this allows you to tear open some expressions and run atom on them, basically. Uh, and then the final one is cons. There's some in the middle that we won't discuss. Three of them, actually. Uh, cons. I'm going to work over here because it's easier to be higher. Uh, so with cons, what you do is, this is probably not surprising, but it's good to see. Uh, you do a double eval, and this is sort of standard for a lot of lists. You operate on the head, C A D R, and you operate on the tail, C A D D R, yes, D D R. And then you do, you know, take the actual thing of the expression and evaluate it in the context of your attribute list. And yeah, that is how you evaluate everything that uh, the, where was that? If the first element is atomic, that's how you elevate it, or that's how you evaluate it. Or if the thing itself is atomic. Now, the lower down versions of this, uh, which happen after those two cases, are the else case, with a true starting it. And that's all about just tearing it open and passing it back to these higher levels. So this is more or less the interpreter of Lisp in like a whiteboard. And on here, it's like the entirety of page 18 or something. It's just, here's an interpreter. Here's how it works. Badass. Um, so that is more or less all we don't have time for because it's 10 minutes over already. A um, few parting notes. Uh, this is 1960 LISP, all capital letters for LISP processing. LISP isn't a language in itself, except in the way it existed in 1960. It's now a family of languages. The same way, yeah, Latin exists, but nobody speaks it, and nobody ever wants to speak it. But French, Spanish, Italian, the Romance languages, you know, actually exist and are used. Same sort of deal, except nowadays we have Racket, Clojure, Emacs, Lisp, uh, Common Lisp, Scheme. Those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, so those actually are alive and well in doing things. For instance. Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot were both sort of behind the scenes. People used Gorilla Lisp to make levels and do calculations for them. So it still gets used. Enclosure is making headways in business because you can run it on the JVM and stuff. And yeah, Lisp is awesome. It's the best programming language ever. And anybody who disagrees with me is wrong. So questions? Come on, Alex. Come on. I just had a note, um, the Hacker News board, like the Y Combinator News thing, is written in ARC list. Y Combinator, thank you. I actually have a note somewhere in here, near the beginning, I've lost it, uh, about the Y Combinator. So you know how we have a label? If I remember correctly, and it was late at night, so it may not be true. Um, just one second? Yeah. Everybody grab drinks. Please. I'm thirsty. I don't know what you guys. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh no, I walked in front of the camera. Oh no. See, I mean, 
I try and get people to present, and I'm like, it's relaxed, look at this. And then people are grabbing drinks and stuff. Like, how more relaxed team can you get? Of course people should present. Anyways, uh, the Y Combinator, remember how we had to introduce a label? Because Factorial had that whole thing where it hadn't been created yet, therefore how could you assign a symbol to it and all that sort of thing? Well, the Y Combinator apparently exists to get around that. It's sort of a magical function, which I've stared at for a really long time and briefly understood, and that was years ago, um, that lets you describe an anonymous function in such a way that it can use itself recursively without giving itself a name, which is cool. Uh, also, if you're interested in crazy, mind-bending things like that, uh, SKI Combinator Calculus is really, really crazy. Um, technically, you only need like two of them. It's S SKI are actually named after birds. That's they don't actually stand for anything useful. Just yeah, it's weird. And it's related to lambda calculus in some way. It's Turing complete, but you only have to use three letters to program anything. Yeah, it's cool. So, any other questions? Not from Alex, preferably. Hi. Um. So the paper had symbolic in the title, and I noticed uh, you had that add one example where you're like recursively kind of creating the integers. Is that what it kind of means by symbolic? Like there's no actual like integer arithmetic other than doing it that recursively? There is integer arithmetic. It's oh. just we didn't bother talking about that because I'm, I'm, I talked too long already. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, um, the symbolic part of it is the fact that um, you've got quote uh, you've got all these symbols everywhere, mm -hmm. and the whole thing is made to manipulate those symbols to the point at which um, these symbolic expressions, these basically lists, lists I'm going to keep doing that between parentheses, are both the data and the code, and when you're manipulating them sort of as code, they're Symbolic, because you're, yeah. There are expressions that have symbols in them, is the simple version, and the longer version is when you try and start uh, giving meaning and manipulating things based on their meaning, you get into the field of symbolic computation, which is kind of what happens when you start getting into macros and other such things. Not a great answer, sorry about that, but yeah. You haven't asked a question yet. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but I expect you to answer a question. Right? It looks uh, like you've got some inefficiencies, right? Um, do you agree? Yeah, Maybe not. There's a lot, right there. Uh, where you're bad at doing the same function over and over again. Yep. It would make more sense if you were able to extract that piece of information somehow and yes. pass it to another function. And in modern Lisps, you totally would do that. Yeah. But, yeah. I'm going to use the COPPA of 1960 everywhere here. 1960. Because computers were so fast back then that they could afford the inefficiencies. Exactly. Well, the other thing is, if you were dealing with this sort of thing, you'd have to worry about um, yeah, I have no idea where that thought was going. <laughs> <laughs> stack depth. <laughs> yes, but it's not stack depth because calling more functions is worse for stack depth, and that's what you're doing here. I'm going to go with they didn't have enough registers. Uh, yes. It had 36 registers, which is more than x86, but anyways. Any other questions? Yes. Um, kind of related to the stack depth question, like I've, I think that, what was that? Scheme or something? I know in like Haskell, for example, they have, it's kind of similar in, uh, in terms of like this kind of stuff. Yeah. So um, they have uh, what's called tail recursive optimization. Tail call optimization. Yeah. Tail call. Yeah. So that. Is that a thing back in this <laughs> <one>? <laughs> No, no, it, nothing was a thing back here. Okay. But uh, in fact, even common lists. Uh, so I was doing Project Euler. Yes, I'm going to call it Euler. Uh, back a while. <laughs> I do it just to make people cringe. So I was doing everything in common lisp because I don't know, I messed in the head. 
And uh, I actually ran into that exact problem because common Lisp as a standard doesn't mandate that uh, interpreters implement tail call optimization. Oh, okay. So it was easy to just blow up the stack. Yeah. So just taking pretty much the same code and switching it to scheme, which in the standard requires tail call optimization, just gets rid of all that. Cool. So scheme is better for that, worse for everything else because it's missing most features. That's going to be controversial. Which yeah, problem then, blew, blew up on you? Oh, I can't even remember. <laughs> there will be literally dozens of people angry at you. <laughs> dozens? <laughs> for the, yeah, for scheme and the or Euler thing. Uh, the best one though, the best uh, puzzle that is for, like, for the longest time just destroyed me. Uh, hexagonal orchards, it's like 362 or something. It's, it's, we just jumped to that one randomly because it looked graphically and that spent years on it. <laughs> <laughs> Turned out it, it, it's one function that if you know math enough, it's just that function, the answer to that function. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Can I run away? Okay, shut off the camera. We're done now. Yeah. We'll find